Hi, everyone, and welcome to week four of our Introduction to Analytics Statistics, Statistics course. And this week, we're going to be covering more statistical concepts. I'm really going to get into more kind of theory questions and the kind of basic underlying that um, allows us to do the things we're going to learn the rest of the semester. So all of statistics can be boiled down into building models. And we talked, oh gosh, a couple of lectures ago about how all statistics can be boiled down into one basic equation. And this is not the equation that I was talking about, but let's look at how we can think differently about statistics. So the only equation you'll ever need, right? Is that every person here, our outcome, um, each individual unit of data point, right? can be interpreted as some sort of model plus some amount of error because we don't always get every person's score right with our model. That's the last time we talked about the mean as a model. And so in theory, every person's point in a group, right, is the mean plus some form of error. So they're either higher than the mean, so you have to add error to it back to mean, or they're lower, you have to subtract it. And I think when I first read the field book many moons ago, this really like solidified a lot of things that have been floating around in my brain. Because I've never thought about statistics really this way. You know, it's so, okay, just I, this time I got to run a t-test and this time I have to run an ANOVA. And this really allows us to think about which model is the best representation of the data. And then what test statistic could I run on that model? And so we fit models um, to our data, but we have to figure out this error thing. And we sort of started talking about this in the last lecture. So how do I know if the model is any good, right? Or if there's a lot of error associated with that particular model and maybe something else would be better. Right? And then, then towards the end of the lecture, we'll start talking about like, how do I know if my hypotheses are about these models are supported. Okay. So when I say model here, I can't, the model can include the hypothesis, like a regression model tends to include that hypothesis, but it also can just be, here's the best representation for that group. For example, a t-test, we have, you know, a model for group one and a model for group two. And then the hypothesis question is, are those models equal? Okay. And so, uh, you know, I also teach a structural equation modeling course. So I spent a lot of time talking about model fit. And so it just makes a lot of sense that we would treat all models this way. So the, the idea of measuring fit for our models an error should be small to conclude that the model is a good fit to the data. Okay. This is not the quite the same way we talk about this in more complex models like structural equation models or regression. Um, but we can start to think about like, does the mean really represent this group of people if there's a lot of error? Is that a good number to use to boil everyone down to? Or are there some sort of other ways to best represent the data? Okay. So <clears throat> measuring fit lets us kind of know how well this represents reality. And remember that the, um, that the mean, we're gonna pick on the mean in this lecture. It could be a correlation. It could be um, the median or any other kind of number of things, but let's pick on the mean. So, you know, the mean is a number that's not necessarily even represented in the data. So let's say you took an exam and the average score was an 85.32. Well, no one maybe actually scored an 85.32. So why would I consider that the best representation of the data, right? Well, if the error associated with that is really small, it means everybody's scores are pretty close to that. So it's pretty good representation. Right? But no statistical model is perfect. There is always some form of associated error. If there's no variance and no error, you have nothing to do, okay? Because that means all the scores are the same. And so we've been talking about the mean, it represents as, as this typical score. I actually really don't love this uh, name for the mean because you know sometimes they're not typical at all because they're influenced heavily by things like outliers or you know again, it's not a score that you may not even have. So 
what we're going to take a brief pause and do is uh, learn a little bit more code and look at the apply family. These are kind of the workhorse family functions in R that allow you to do what is equivalent to loops and other languages. You can do loops in R too, but apply makes this much faster computationally. And it'll allow us to calculate a bunch of means or models at once, especially by group. And so calculating descriptives by group is really useful. Okay. Now there are some other functions like describe by and psych, um, but if you can get the basics of apply and all of its family friends, you can do almost anything. And I feel like apply was something when I first started learning R that I really struggled to understand. And there are days when L apply makes my brain hurt. Um, but I think understanding them allows you to flexibly do things with data sets. So let's look at those. Now apply as the main function is um, one that allows us to, to calculate over data frames. Okay. So the arguments for apply include some sort of X as a data frame, the margin, and then some sort of function. So as you're starting to read the manual, <laughs> you'll see this fun thing a lot. And that just stands shorthand for function. So what function do I want to apply to my data frame? Okay. And so our objective here is to apply a function to the rows of a data frame or matrix or the columns. Okay, rows are represented by one because they come first. Remember it's rows comma columns. Columns are represented by two. Okay. I think you can actually do both as well, but stick with one or the other just to get started. And the input here is either data frame or matrix. So it has to be dimensional data. If you try to input a vector, it's gonna get mad at you because it doesn't have rows or columns. It's just one unit of data. And so the output kind of depends, but generally you can get it coerced, right? Into almost anything and it tends to save them. I actually don't remember. Let's go look. I'm like, I, I don't, don't remember what it saves them as. So let's clear last lecture out here. Let's see, twink, twink. All right, so let's see if we save this. So this is one way that I learn how things are saved so that I can use them again later. And I, I don't actually know. So I'm just gonna copy this code that I have and just save it as some temporary variable. Click, click, click. And then I'm gonna look at this structure, SDR of temp here. And so it saves itself as a named number. Okay. So these are the numbers and this is the names. So a named number is often just a vector so let's see if we can use that. Because it's not a dimensional data piece, I can't use the dollar sign here. But I bet we can coerce this into a data frame. Now it's a data frame, but it's five observations of one variable, which isn't really what we wanted. So we may have some cool, you know, some different things to do to get it maybe as a, um, a uh, long piece, but as a vector, that's really pretty useful. Okay. And we're going to use this apply function as a vector many times in the next couple lectures. So um, go get to practice. Okay. So it saves it as a vector. All right. So what did I do here? Well, first thing I did was I changed the scientific notation because this particular data set has, for some reason, it, it's the, the decimals are really, really long. And so I just said, you know what, show me 20 decimals, like cut off the scientific notation. Okay. You can change this to any number you'd like. So you can change it to psi pen equals one. And so that'll pretty much squish every variable. If you set it to 999, which forever I just thought was like a, um, the, the actual number that you were supposed to put to like turn off scientific notation. And actually what you're doing is you're just saying, show me 999 decimals before you convert to scientific notation. So you can make this any kind of whatever level of precision you'd like. I think R stores something like 16 point floats. So, you know, 20, 20 will do you good. Now I used apply here. Okay. So I applied it to my Quakes data set. I used two for columns and I told it to give me the mean. So this gives me the mean of every column, which I can also get with summary, but I'm just trying to show you how this works. Um, 
And if I wanted to do instead do rows, I could change this to one. And so if you can't remember which one's which, remember it's rows and then columns, just try it and see how many numbers you get back. If you were trying for columns, you'll know real fast that you did it wrong. <laughs> and then, so this prints out nicely. I just rounded everything to two decimals. Okay. So apply, it's a data frame, one or two, and then the function you want to apply. Okay. Now you can do complex functions too, but stick right now, just as you're learning, with easy functions like standard deviation or mean. But the thing to notice here is that you don't put in any parentheses or anything in that function. So normally when we do the mean, we have to tell it what to do the mean on. Right? Uh, here, you just put in the name of the function, no extra pieces. Now, L apply usually stands for list apply. Okay, you can call it lappy, lappy if you want, because it makes me laugh, but it's L apply. And what you do is you put in usually a list. Uh, it doesn't have to be a list though, but L apply I think is specifically designed for lists. Um, and then the function. So there's no one or two here. Okay. And so it will apply that function to all elements of that input. Okay. And so it'll kind of coerce data frames into lists and run through each name, each column basically. So you can also put in a vector, but it will apply that function to everything, every instance in a vector, which if you're doing the mean, doesn't make any sense, right? So if you have like a list, a vector of, of you know, our magnitudes here, then applying the mean to each individual data point won't work because you have to have more than one. So this makes more sense, um, this function anyway, to apply to a list or a data frame. Now applying things to lists is really handy because sometimes we might want to only grab you know, the third object out of every list or only grab the first four, <laughs> Ooh, excuse me. Um, then, or what else have I done to lists? Uh, combined them together. So this really helps us work like with grabbing information from a list and um, converting it to something else. Now the output you get back, unfortunately, is a list. So that's, you know, workable, I guess. <laughs> I don't love lists. Um, so they, that depends. Like if you want more vectorized output, go with apply. If you want list output, go with L apply. It just kind of depends on your goals. Okay. So we did the same thing on the same data set. So quakes mean, and it gave us each one of these. Now here's the advantage to this. Okay. So a minute ago, we made our temp variable, although I've since converted it. Let's go back. So let's make our temp variable here. And we see that it's a named number. Okay, it's a nice cute little table, right? It told us it's a named number, but that means I can't use a dollar sign. The good thing about L apply here, oops, missed it, is that it's a list. So we can use the dollar sign. And that's potentially one advantage there. Okay. Now, if it's a vector, I can just slap it on to with another vector or put it in a data frame, which we'll do in a couple weeks. But if I need each data point by name, the list might be more advantageous. Okay. So again, depends on the goals. Now, supply or S supply is like a, a simpler version of L apply. It's like, uh, let's look, I'm learning all the things today. Um, so L apply returns a list, S apply returns, it's a user friendly version of L apply that returns a vector. Okay, so simple simplifies what the S stands for. So it looks a lot like L apply because they're friends, cousins, brother, sister, somewhere in there. Uh, if we're gonna stick with this like apply family analogy. Okay. And so it will take a list of vector or data frame. I'm like apply, which only takes data frames or matrices and it outputs it usually as a vector. Okay. So this S apply looks a lot like apply right now because it has simplified it to a vector. But let's see what kind of structurally that returns as. 
I think the structure function as you're learning can really help you under, start to understand these object types. So I, I like really encourage you to just, just explore, like what does this save as? <laughs> Where does it save everything? Okay. And it does return that named number. Okay. And so our named number, again, does not allow us to call it with those names. But again, we could use the square brackets to grab a specific one. And it's only one bracket because it's only one row of data. Okay, so it doesn't have a comma. That's what I'm trying to say. Last but not least is my personal favorite, which is T apply. Okay, so T apply is like one of my favorite humans, <laughs> if it were human. All right, and so what it does is it allows us to calculate by group is the way I think about T apply. So it stands for table apply effectively. And it, instead of calculating by row or by column, I can split the data by another variable. And so the arguments here are X, which is uh, usually some one column of data. I think you may be able to use more than one, but like it's usually a vector of data in some form. Index here is not one versus two. Index is um, the variable you want to split on and you can use more than one. And then the function you want to run. Okay. And so it allows us to compute or run a function on each factor onto the original column or columns. And so the way I, I think about T apply is that it, the, the, the dependent variable goes first. This is the thing I want to run the function on. Here's the thing I want to split by, which this data set doesn't have a really good example. So we're just going to split by station because that technically is categorical. Okay. And here's the function I want to run. Okay. Now in the, the examples, it doesn't have this list thing here. And if you only have one, you don't have to use this. But if you want to use more than one, you have to put them in a list. So you have to say list and then put all of them in there and it will continue to split. So that's really great when we get to things like ANOVA where we have multiple groups and you want to, um, to calculate the means and standard deviations for each group. And at the very end of the lecture, I'll show you how to apply T apply for some other packages. So let's come back now to fit because we'll use some of those functions. So if we use our mean as the model, we can measure fit by seeing how much the scores vary around the mean. This is our standard deviation, right? But I really want to bring back a conversation that we had in the last lecture about sample sources populations and um, improve on our measure of model fit. Okay, so I'm going to give you another one. Now we can think about raw deviations, which is the difference between the mean and the data point. And so we talked about this last time where the raw deviations is X minus the mean. And so what you end up with is um, a pile of data centered around the mean where the mean is zero and you have half of them are negative, half of them are positive and they're equally weighted because that's how the mean practically works. This is a weighted average right, it's a weighted score where the median is literally half of the data is on one side and half of the data is on the other side. But remember with the mean, half of the weight is on one side, half of the weight's on the other. So I got my, my deviations here. And we could, in theory, preview, you know, if you remember the last lecture, you'll know where this is going, but uh, we could just add them all up. Okay. And that will tell us how much scores vary around the mean. And um, then we have our fit. Okay. The problem with that is like, since we're adding them up, we've got half positive, half negative on the weight. When you add them up, they add up to zero, always. Okay. And zero in this case is not a mathematically interesting number because they always add up to zero, it doesn't matter. And so mathematician solutions to this is to just square it. Okay. And so we would square those. And so sometimes this is called the sum of squared error. Other solution is actually to take the absolute value. And sometimes it's called MAD, the minimum absolute deviation. Uh, that's a possible option too, but most statistician people use standard deviation. 
So deviations canceled out because they're centered around the mean. They always add up to zero, just to keep that written down. So the sim simple solution is to square them. And if we add up just the squared deviations, we get the sum of squared error, which we'll see as SS. And that is the top half of our variance formula. So the top half there of the, this is the original variance formula for populations is the sum of squared error. But we don't always have that population, right? So more often than not, we just have some sort of sample. The population implies that you have every single possible data point, which as a person who studies humans and words, it's like not possible. <laughs> Right. So what do I do to account for the fact that I'm using a sample? And this is where we're going to change that formula to be what's called mean squared error. Okay. And this is still the variance formula. Okay. It just sometimes gets a fancy name called mean squared error. Um, you know, sum of squares is... Uh, a useful number in the sense, like it's just the top half here uh, at measuring very at measuring deviations. But you know, the more numbers you have, the more deviations you'll have, and so the number can get astronomically big. And so you don't actually know what the number means if you have a lot of data. Okay. So instead, we're going to use what's called mean squared error or variance, and divide by n minus one. Okay. And so this n minus one thing is where we're going to start to get into this like theoretical distinction between populations where we know every single number and our reality, which is samples. Okay. Because last time we talked about this formula where it's n on the bottom and that matches the mean, it's the average squared deviation. But now it's not quite the average squared deviation anymore because we're doing n minus one on the bottom. Okay. And what is the purpose of that? So let's get into what are degrees of freedom, which is what this little DF stands for. Okay. So mean squared error is a different name for variance. And we're now gonna use the sample variance formula. Okay. One critical difference here. And that is, I'm just like, I'm gonna make sh sure this is clear pretty much nobody uses the population formula. Okay. We're always going to use the, the sample formula. Um, and then all of the code that you've learned actually uses the sample formula as well. So when you know everyone, use the full sample size. I challenge you to tell me when that's true. And instead, we're going to use the adjusted value to account for sampling error. So this n minus one adjusts for the fact that we know we don't know everyone's score. Okay. Degrees of freedom are really like, there's this like theoretical layer and then there's this practical layer. So we're gonna kinda, I'm gonna try to skate the middle here on explaining degrees of freedom. Um, but one thing that you can think about is that we always know, we know we're not perfect. We know there's measurement error. We know sometimes subjects are not paying attention. Right? Computer errors happen. And so we really want to overestimate the amount of variance. So we want to overestimate the bad score, essentially. So variance, remember, is our measure of misfit. It's our measure of error. And by overestimating, we're like, we're, we're, it sounds bad. Like I want to, I want to estimate the error is a little larger than possible than, than, than maybe it is, because then we're not at least um, saying things are better than they are. So we're allowing these numbers to be slightly higher because we know we're not perfect. So we want to overestimate error just a little bit rather than underestimate because underestimate could lead us to believe things that aren't true. So let's talk about what are degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, there are lots of definitions for degrees of freedom. But the most common one is it's the number of values in a final calculation of a statistic that are free to vary. Yep. I remember sitting in my intro stats class being like, what the hell is she talking about? Right. So um, what this actually implies is it's the number of things that can change in our analysis and keep the same 
statistic. Okay. So let's say we have x plus two, x plus y equals four. Okay. How many of those numbers can we change and keep four? Right. So if I make x two, y has to then be two. If I make x one, y then has to be three. If I make x 10, y has to be negative six. That's about the extent of my math I can do right now. So I have two scores. It's the number of values that can change and keep the same statistic. I can change only one of them. Okay. And so you'll see this formula many, many times is n minus one. But really what it's telling you is it's n minus parameters. This will make a lot more sense later, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, if I've done my job. But it's essentially this idea of like n minus the number of things we are estimating. Okay. So in a mean, that's n minus 1, because all we're estimating is the mean. But in covariance, if you remember our covariance formula, um, that can often end up being n minus 2. Okay. Or for correlation, it's n minus 2, because we're estimating means for x and y. So it's generally related to the number of independent variables in an analysis. So if you do a regression analysis with eight variables, it's more complicated than n minus eight, but it's the approximately this idea of n minus eight because you have to keep at least one co variable constant to calculate the mean for each of those. Um, and so the purpose of doing this is to account for the use of samples to not underestimate our error. Okay. So theoretically is the like, it's the number of things that I can vary, but very practically, it's this idea of controlling, making sure that we don't um, underestimate error. And so we'll get a lot more back into those. We'll use them all semester. And so you'll start to see the formulas on the bottom always have degrees of freedom. So a summary, if I'm trying to interpret the standard deviation as a measure of model fit, because okay, mean squared error, right, is variance, the sample variance, we could take the square root and go back to standard deviation. Uh, large values would indicate a poor fit. The mean is a poor representation of, of the data because there's a lot of variability. Small values indicate better model fit. There's no like perfect fit or you no, know, I'm just using negative and positive adjectives here, but the mean is very close to the rest of the scores. Okay. But standard deviation is based on the scale of the data. So if you're using income, a large value is gonna be really different than if you're using um, your teacher evaluations that are one to five. Okay. A large value in that might be two because of the range, you know, you can only move so far from the middle. Right? But in an income scale, your standard deviation might be uh, 20,000 and that's in the normal range. And so for this, this takes a little bit of looking at the, the type of data you're interested in to know what's big and what's small. Okay? And so I think there are still, you know, studies where I've, well, I'm looking at data I've looked at thousands of times and I'm like, hmm, is that bigger than normal? <laughs> is it smaller than normal? Hmm. And sometimes if it's really different, that can help clue me out that there's something wrong with the underlying data set, like it didn't get imported correctly. Okay. So you always have to stop and think about what is the scale and what does large mean? And so we're going to use standard deviation rather than mean squared error, although we're going to come back to this concept of mean squared error in a minute, um, because it's in the scale of the data. Okay. Now, this whole thing leads us to this idea. So we're talking about how standard deviations are based on the sample. But the whole goal of statistics is to refer back to the actual population. So remember that the population is the larger group of things that you want to, to um, to represent, right? You want your sample of P, let's go with people, it's easier. So your sample of people represent this larger population and this, the, the effect, the study that you did on this sample of people you hope will apply to this larger group. 
Are you going to think about drugs and vaccines? Is something really popular thinking about right now? And you're hoping that the sample that they took is representative because then you know what the actual side effects are going to be on the larger group, everybody else. Right? And so for a long time, drug studies were only run on certain types of people, like no pregnant women, right? Mostly no women. Um, because we could get pregnant and that would be very bad, right? And, and so there are a lot of drugs that went to market without um, testing on a representative population and it went very poorly. Okay. It was really great. I think it's Radiolab about this topic, about how they didn't test some of the drugs. And then uh, if you look up, there was a um, uh, pregnancy uh, nausea drug that caused a lot of birth defects because of this problem. So we want our samples to be representative of our larger population. So we're calculating all of our numbers so far based on that sample. But what if I wanna say, well, here's what the sample is. So I expect this value out of the population. That's where standard error comes in. Okay. So standard deviation tells me how well the mean represents the sample data. But if I wanna estimate that in the population, in theory, what I would do is take multiple samples. Okay. So I would take uh, a bunch of samples of people, right? calculate what's called over here, the sampling distribution, where we calculate, take a, the, the mean of each sample and okay, make a distribution of that. So instead of a, a distribution of the raw scores for each one of these happy little people, we have a distribution of each sample's mean, and that's called the sampling distribution. Uh, a normal distribution, a frequency distribution, is a distribution of raw scores. So every single person is part of those bars. And uh, the sampling distribution is like the is a distribution of means of each of these groups. And what that sampling distribution helps me do is helps me figure out what is the variance in the population. So instead we figure out the, the variance of the means rather than the variance of the people. But in reality, I mean, we should run replications, our own work, but you often don't have time or the money or whatever. You only had 200 people that day. That's all you can do. Okay. There are other ways to kind of combat some of these problems, but in general, we may not run multiple studies. Thankfully, some very smart people have run what are called Monte Carlos, where you do simulation studies to understand how something like a sampling distribution works, where they make up fake data and sample from the population to see. And this has led us to two mathematical theorems that are very useful for statistics, which is the central limit theorem and the law of large numbers. I would say that no matter what you do in your life, you need to go and Google distribution bunnies. So let's see here, distribution bunnies, YouTube. Okay. And watch this video. It's hilarious, it's cute, and it explains the idea of the central limit theorem. Okay. And it actually also a little bit talks about the law of large numbers, but it's mostly about the central limit theorem. Okay. And it's great. I promise three minutes well spent. Either way, a quick explanation of what these two things are. So the central limit theorem is this idea that as sample size increases, so as we add more participants to our study, the distribution of sample means okay, will approximate normal. Okay, not the distribution itself okay, of the people, but the distribution of those individual sample means. So let's say I have a sample of five participants and I take five five-person samples, the distribution of sample means may be fairly uniform. It may be kind of flat, it may be skewed. Now I have a distribution of 100 and take 500 person samples, that will approximate more of a normal distribution. Okay. So um, as sample size increases, the, the sampling distribution approximates normal, not the data. Okay. And that is a point we'll come back to in our uh, week of data screening. And then for the law of large numbers, as sample size increases, the sample mean approximates the population mean. And that's also very handy.
Because what we're talking about right now is how do we figure out the variance in the population, even though we don't have it? Okay. We haven't even mentioned how do we figure out if our sample model is worth its salt for the population. Okay. And that's where the law of large numbers comes in. So the larger your sample size, the more confident you can feel that your mean of that sample actually represents the larger population. And that should just like make practical sense. Like it should brain-wise be like, duh. Right? The more people I have, the more data points I have, the more comfortable I am saying that this accurately represents uh, everybody else. Okay, if I have five people and I say, well, the average was four and that represents everybody, you'd be like, but you took five people. If I have 400,000 participants, I feel better about that. Okay. Now, as a social scientist, I don't know if I ever get samples quite that large. Okay. But I have run studies where we've gotten 50, 40,000 participants, which is like a lot <laughs> for us. Cut us some slack here. And we feel, I feel better that the numbers that we give people more accurately represent um, the larger group of people. Okay. All right. So now we know that our sample mean M will more will more or likely approximate the population mean, which is usually called mu, okay, the Greek letter mu. But we still have to solve this problem that the standard deviation is only good for the sample. So I've got to figure out the variance on my population. Okay, and that's called the standard error. Okay. So the standard error, one more here, um, is a different is a measure of spread or dis dis dispersion in the population. And so this is a theoretical estimate because obviously we don't have the population, uh, but this is where all those Monte Carlos come in and we can approximate it okay. and give it our best guess. So we can say that the, the mean, our X bar M approximates mu, the population mean in large samples. Okay. And before you ask me how large is too large, give it a couple weeks. And we'll figure out what that magic, the magic number is. Okay. Um, the sampling distribution though, is just naturally gonna be different because a sample, the, histo the histogram of all of our people, one person comes out way over here, you're gonna have a, a skewed distribution, right? So each person could potentially change the shape of that distribution and the variance will be, could be quite large or it could be small. But the sampling distribution, remember, is, a, is a, a histogram of the means. And so the means have already kind of accounted for the, all of these different weights. And with large enough samples, the outliers become less of a problem. So the means are automatically going to be much closer together because you've taken each of those samples and averaged them and squashed them down into one number and then are making a histogram. So that's naturally going to be much smaller. Okay. And so I got to figure out how to estimate that because this is the number we use for our statistical testing. So it's actually quite simple. You just divide the standard deviation by the square root of n. Okay. So now we've affected the, the, at the variance scores, our estimate of fit, twice by n. Okay. And this is why sample size is so critical. Because if you have a small sample size, you're going to get dinged with it twice, right? Because you're only by, dividing by a small number. The larger the sample size, the better you can help your approximating fit. And so model fit often is termed by sample size in our case. Okay. Um, so it is SD divided by the square root of N. Okay. And I'm going to recommend uh, using psych to calculate this. Although in a little bit, I'll show you how you could do this with T apply as well, because psych does do this calculate for you automatically. So in this particular example, we have a really, you know, quite a small standard deviation, but this is still in the scale of the data on the sample. And notice here that the standard error, which is the variance of the means, if we sampled the means a bunch of times, is uh, much smaller. Okay, so 0.01. So it's the square root, it's 0.4 divided by the square root of um, 1,000. Now it's not n minus one, it's still just n in this case. And so that leads me to the kind of final hurrah for this set of slides. And 
it's this idea of like measuring model fit. Now I could just say, here's the mean and here's my standard deviation. Okay, that's good enough for me. I can look at that and start to interpret it. And it'll tell me the same thing about model fit. Okay. I personally tend to look at the standard deviation because it's easier for me to think about the scale of the data and think about if this is large or small. Okay. But in cases where I only have the standard error, well, one, I can undo it, but multiply by the square root of n, but um, that's also useful. So it kind of depends on the analysis, which one I might look at. But as long as you have the sample size and the mean, you can get from one to the other. Okay. So they do tell you the same thing about model fit. But personally, I think 0.4 gives me a good idea. So most of the magnitudes of these earthquakes are between 4.2 and 5. Okay. I would say that's probably a pretty good representation of this data. But you can also make confidence intervals. And so you see a lot of times that people won't report the standard deviation or the standard error, they'll give you a confidence interval. And as long as it's a normal confidence interval, I could work backwards, it's kind of pain. But um, what is a confidence interval? Well, here's the theoretical definition. Okay, So it is a range of scores above and below a point estimate, usually in the mean. So the mean plus or minus some value that the population parameter is believed to be in um, along with some sort of probability that we're estimating this population parameter. Okay, that's like directly, I think, either from the book or from Wikipedia or somewhere. Okay? And that is like kind of the winding path of this. The idea behind a confidence interval is that it's a range of scores that you expect the true population mean to be in. So I've just said with the law of large numbers, we expect the sample to approximate the population mean. Okay. Like the larger than the sample, the more likely those two things will be the same. Okay. Now, we're not stupid. We've already talked about how we know we aren't perfect and we never get models exactly right. So uh, a confidence interval, it, given the data that I have, here's what I might guess the population mean to be between. And then here's my confidence level of that guess. Okay. Now the other, other way people talk about confidence intervals is let's say we have a 95% confidence interval. It's one of the most common ones. The idea is that if I ran a hundred samples, 95% of those confidence intervals would contain the true population mean. So with this 95% confidence interval, I'm 95% confident, so to speak, that I have captured the true population mean between the lower and upper limits. Sometimes that's called the long run relative interpretation, right? So over time, if I ran a bunch of samples, 95% of them would contain that mean. And that's what this picture is meant to show you. Okay. And so if this is the true population mean here, and this is an Andy Field example, so of course it's about, um, ridiculous things. So here's a true population mean. The dots on this plot, sometimes it's called a forest plot. The dots are the means of those samples and the bars here are the confidence intervals. So you can see that most of the confidence intervals contain the true population mean. A couple of them don't because that's the way it goes. And that confidence level is one minus alpha. We'll get into what the heck alpha is in the next little section. Now, it's usually expressed as either 95, 90, or 99%. I would say 95 is the most common one, although uh, depending on the area of statistics, you might see a 90% one as well. And so these, um, to be the most confident, actually get bigger as you go. So if you want to be 99% confident, you have to make your interval wider to make sure that you capture it all the time. And this seems very pie in the sky. Like this is, you know, this is the, the range of true, like this uh, range here represents the possible population parameters, you know, if I ran this a hundred times. But really what it tells me, the more practical interpretation is it's, it's a representation of the model fit. So really wide confidence intervals mean that you really aren't very sure what the population parameter is because the confidence interval is so wide. Really narrow confidence interval means you probably have a bunch of participants in your study. And so 
the standard error has gotten smaller because confidence intervals are built on standard error. Uh, and so I have a better understanding of what that population parameter actually is. And so I, when I see confidence intervals, it just allows me to think like, okay, well, if it's really big, remember it's defined by the scale of the data, it's really big, then they don't really know what the heck this number should be. But if it's really small, then we have a good feeling what that number should be. And that brings us back to fit and to standard error. So there was a, a winding path to get to measuring model fit here. And so let's just show you an example of how these are calculated that I think will bring together all of these pieces at once. And so in the last lecture, we talked about how 1.96 was the 95% cutoff score and 2.58 was the 99% cutoff score for z-scores. Now, most of what we'll do, it will calculate that confidence interval for us, but I think it's useful to see what the formula is so we can solidify these concepts. Okay. And so let's create a confidence interval around the mean, but we want it to be in the unit of the scale of the data, not z-score units. So I couldn't just say mean plus or minus 1.96. That wouldn't mean anything to people. And so the formula for the upper limit is the mean plus the z-score cutoff, so either 1.96 or 2.58 times standard error. And the lower limit is the mean minus, whoops, that's a typo. I'll fix that. The mean minus z-score cutoff times standard error. And then that's bringing us back to standard error. If we're trying to estimate populations, we got to know what the variance is in the population. Why use standard error? Oh, right, I just said this. Uh, because we're trying to approximate the population parameter. But why use the z-score cutoff? And this is the assumption that you're working with a normal distribution. But again, we need the large sample size to approximate that normal distribution, the central limit, uh, central limit here. Uh, and other analyses will use a T distribution, um, for example. So this is not always Z, but with large enough sample sizes, many things approximate a Z distribution. More on that in a couple of weeks. So I just did an example here of how to, uh, how to calculate these. And so I'm gonna use apply and calculate a bunch at once. And we use T apply in the next lecture. So I say, you know what? Give me the mean of all of the columns in the Quakes data set. Give me the standard error of all of the columns. And I said, you know, it's just a pity that R doesn't have this like base standard error function because it's really easy. Um, so what I did was I created my own function. I said, okay, a function I want to know is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the lengths being in. So the square root of the sample size. This just allows me to calculate standard error on every column. I could also use psych. But the nice thing about saving them this way is that now I can apply formulas to these saved vectors to get my upper and lower limit. So I did the mean plus 1.96 times standard error. There's even a better way to do this, but I don't want to do too much at once. And so here's the upper confidence interval for all of our columns. Okay, stations doesn't make a lot of sense here because stations is a, a really a category, but just roll with me here. Here's the actual mean for all those columns. And then here's the lower limit for all those columns. So latitude and longitude, yeah, again, that doesn't make sense, but let's look at depth and magnitude. Okay, so magnitude, here's our 4.62. The confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval is 4.64 on the top and 4.6 essentially on the bottom. So we're saying that the 95% confident, okay, or if I ran this 100 times, 95% of the confidence intervals would contain the true population mean, and that would be between 4.6 and 4.64. With our mean estimate is 4.62, that is very small. Okay. So I'd say the mean is probably a good estimate of the data. We have a large sample size, so we can probably be confident that that's about the average magnitude of the earthquake. And so that is kind of wrapping up this idea of, of, of we're, gonna, we're creating these samples, but we want to really know something about the population and how we bring those two things together, the purpose of standard error and measuring model fit. Okay, standard error is going to be a main component to many of our statistical analyses because 
it's a measure of the population um, variance, which is error. And so from here, what we're going to do is talk about traditional null hypothesis, null hypothesis testing, right? And how these things tie into the theoretical concepts behind null hypothesis testing. So make your way over to that video next.